Praxis im Online. Online talk at uh, the second round. It is my pleasure on behalf of the GNU SSK research team to declare open uh, today's online talk. I'm Jung Su Park uh, from Gyeongsang National University. I would like to appreciate organizer of the talk, uh, Professor Song Jin Chung, for allowing me to moderate uh, this talk. It is distinct honor uh, to introduce our speaker for today, Professor Anjan Chakravarti, University of Calcutta, a reading scholar in India. Thank you very much for presentation, despite the difficult situation. And again, my deepest condolence to you and your family. Uh, let me briefly uh, go over the ground rules uh, for the talk. To begin with, the Professor Anjan will uh, present for 40 minutes around. And after, we will get into a question and answer period. Uh, we will close our talk up to around 4.30. Uh, now, I will turn the microphone to Professor Anjan. Shall we start? Thank you. Thank you, Professor Park. Mm -hmm. And uh, let me just put this up. Uh, and uh, when, uh, just a request to you, when I'm near uh, 40 minutes, uh, kindly, if yes. I'm crossing it, just intervene, okay? Mm -hmm. So, because I have a long way to go, so I will uh, try to be, uh, you know, stop wherever, uh, whenever the time is up. Okay? Yes, don't so, worry about that. Yes, yes. Mm. Uh, okay. Um, so, this is the topic. of uh, today's uh, seminar and uh, because there is a focus on uh, risk construction throughout uh, the uh, we, uh, you know the, the two sets of uh, at least the, the the concept note that we had so i had tried to uh, uh, you know produce it in 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 a way where it of course refers to the context in India from where I am uh, thinking and theorizing to a large degree and where the master trope uh, of uh, in, in a place like India is development, you know. So, uh, and it has, of course, a lot of connotation, but we need not get, it, get to that. Uh, now, in that particular uh, domain, how do we uh, can think of a post-capitalist politics of reconstruction, you know. And so the problem, of course, is, uh, in fact, if you recall the first uh, lecture I had given, earlier lecture I had given in the first series, then it was on Shankar Gohaniyogi, who was uh, from a, a reconstructive point, you know, uh, from a point of praxis, trying to construct a post a capitalist politics here. This lecture, on the other hand, uh, will be mostly on uh, building up uh, the, uh, the theory uh, and, or dealing with the theory and uh, in terms of uh, in terms of the hegemonic discourse in India, which is development and uh, how we can uh, you know launch a critique of that category, because unless we do that, there is no way we can see the uh, beyond of it and talk about reconstruction. And when we talk about reconstruction, I'm really talking about reconstru reconstruction from a Marxist angle, you know, something that is related to uh, uh, more specifically here, uh, class. I mean, there is more to it than class, but of course, but. Uh, we will, uh, you know, this is what we'll focus upon. So that is uh, the topic I will discuss. My lecture will be organized in some way in terms of 
it will be very telegraphic because this is the work which has been going on for the last i've been doing for the last 25 30 years uh, you know and uh, along the way for the last 20 years this really work i have uh, i've been joined by professor onup dhar uh, who is a philosopher and a psychoanalyst uh, along the way and uh, other people like Stephen Kallenberg, who recently passed away, and many others, actually. So uh, in that light, uh, it is a kind of project which is ongoing, where at the heart of the project is lies the question right from the beginning, uh, when I started thinking over this issue, the question of politics. You know, how do you rethink politics uh, you know, in, a, in a new way? And being an, an, a student of economics, economics, it was a question of relating uh, the economic discourses to that of the that of uh, political thinking in a radical direction, displacing it in a radical direction. So uh, really, there are, I will go very telegraphically because it involves these or have all been worked out in various phases. Uh, in in all kinds of work that we have done, I have sent you just uh, two papers just to get a sample of uh, the kind of uh, things that we have done. Uh, but uh, the focus will be uh, made, basically the organization will be more or less telegraphically relaying to you the steps that uh, that signifies a move from the hegemonic discourse to that of reconstruction. As far as possible, I'll try to uh, provide that. For the details, you will have to, of course, we can discuss it after the lecture is over, but more see, uh, on, if you really want to go over it, then you will have to look at the work that uh, underlines all these uh, pro uh, propositions, hypotheses, problems, and their expansion. Uh, detailed uh, uh, analysis. So the first thing is, which is, which was, which we can identify it as a problem is the kind of, uh, you know, unthinking isomorphism that works uh, coming from an economics department, particularly strong, uh, works between uh, the concept of capitalism and the concept of economy economy and it's almost as if the two are uh, equivalent and we of course are uh, aware this part of the history of economic ideas that uh, you know uh, that the, how the birth of economy as an autonomous social sphere appeared actually alongside that of the birth of industrial capitalism and so uh, it is not surprising that uh, these two dovetailed into one another, you know, and uh, it, it is a problem because then what happens is when we talk about reconstruction, really, uh, we can't see anything almost as if we are trapped by this uh, discourse of capitalism or this a signifier of capitalism beyond it, we can't move, you know, and so kind of fix a uh, uh, a kind of, uh, you know, lens or a, uh, what we may call a lens from the perspective of capital or what Gibson, following Gibson Graham, we can call uh, capitalocentrism. And I'll come to this later. This is a problem, okay? Because it reduces the complexity and heterogeneity of the economy to that of uh, capital, thereby leaving hardly any scope for us to uh, move beyond. Now, what I want to emphasize here is this really problem number two, which we uh, we had dealt with this a lot in our own work, uh, which is uh, another kind of dual, you know. So, uh, in fact, uh, capitalocentrism is associated with a dual in the realm of the economy that I will describe today somewhat. Uh, but another dual, which was, which is in general a philosophical problem, really, and it was pointed out by uh, 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 Krishna Chandra Bhattacharya in a, in an essay, Swaraj in India in 1954. I think he wrote this, 
uh, and uh, it, he's, he, of course, is a professor from my university, University of Calcutta, but I think he, he, he summarized this whole framing, uh, what I think has remained a problem among us for the last, uh, previously, that was his understanding, which he was trying to summarize. And even today, continuing till uh, today, to a certain extent. And he described, what he was describing was a trap, a thought trap. And this trap was really based on two kinds of pulses. One is what he called rootless universalism or Western universalism. So capitalism, globalization, and, uh, you know, uh, developmentalism, whichever, uh, you know, one after another, uh, we are faced with this uh, uh, discourse where uh, universal discourse appears, which is abstract and as if, uh, uh, you know, the cannot relate, it's top down and cannot relate itself to the root, that is the specificity of the, uh, of the economic culture, the forms of life, in which they are uh, seen to be applicable. And the important point is, and maybe I'll talk about this a little bit, uh, important point in the con context of uh, discourse of development is, and in our part of the world, I think the rest in terms of the general discourse as well, is uh, the concept of, uh, I, I think I don't have it here, I forgot, third worldism. Third worldism is not for us, as we understand an empirical category, it is a, it is a concept, okay? And it is a concept which is attached to that of uh, some universalism, uh, a universal discourse, more specifically, we'll talk about this universalism in terms of development. And third worldism is an associated category in relation with it. And once you fix that, once you move in terms of this impulse, then the whole, whole uh, discourse, policies, institutional building, politics turns to how you we are going to assimilate and transform the other, which is the third world, in the image of whatever uh, is you are trying, is your objective. So, whether we move from, and this is a impulse that is, that is across left and right. Uh, we see this impulse, whether you are talking about the World Bank or Hart and Negri, uh, who of course announces third world is no more actually, but re-emphasizes, we show in our work, own work actually. Anyway, let's not get into that because that's not the objective of uh, what we are trying to do here. Uh, the second Im impulse, which is equally problematical for us, is uh, that of, uh, we think, particularism, particularism, uh, which is to, to unthinkingly cling on to local cultures or local processes, and, uh, you know, it's a kind of, uh, a, kind of uh, a closet, uh, society or closet, uh, you know, uh, uh, understanding of, of, of a particular which you then valorize, you know. So uh, one of the way you can look at it is if the first impulse is that of the global, then it's global aspect. And the second impulse is a glorification, it boils down to a glorification of the uh, local, you know. And, and in that sense, uh, it, it, it is, this is, this is a very interesting paper because it in a way summarizes actually what I think is uh, much of what we see even in the present time as we swing between the two. Uh, and, and this has continued in my discourse and we're, we discuss it in our own work, you know. And for us, insofar as post-development is concerned, while Post-development is also a complex field. We recognize that and there has been advances, but because of its clinging particularism, it also has, in our opinion, there is a limit to uh, the 
politics of reconstruction you know, and perhaps we will think about it so it's a trap actually why do we have to talk in terms of say and it's a trap in my opinion of uh, you know the whole eurocentric or more specifically may not be eurocentric always but uh, yeah let's call it for convenience sake eurocentric way of thinking that consequently appeared post enlightenment at least one of the way of thinking in which uh, the dual uh, uh, the way you organize uh, thinking and then generate practice based on it is based on the dual uh, it's global versus local modern versus tradition human versus nature you know man versus woman and this organizational uh, theme you know where uh, you know uh, of either you are focusing or emphasizing one or the other uh, is for us a trap you know a trap because once you get into it uh, there is no escape from this uh, from this particular trap you are going to whatever you do you are going to move around this to impulse so uh basically what we had done our own work in the last 15 20 years is how do we get around or beyond this trap you know so we have been developing a new concept called world of the third as a beyond of uh, or a concept of outside and which we in the field of economics uh, we which we tried to uh, designate actually describe analyze designate theorize uh, as world of the third as, as something which is uh, which is a third perspective you know in relation to it from where you can think of politics of reconstruction but let me go further just to set you the let's not get into that let's talk about the uh, problem or the issue in 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 the context of countries such as india and it's global i think uh, the the what has dominated is the discourse of uh, not always not always i mean there has always been challenges to it but at least the dominant understanding since at least the second five year plan you know in india in the 50s you know have been uh, you know uh, capitalist development and i think it's not just an indian thing but it's it's uh, an understanding that has shaped uh, our uh, our way of thought now what i want to describe and this development is while we talk about development what is uh, it's like the, uh, the 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 something that is in at the front line but what is at the background driving development uh, pioneering development is actually capitalism so capitalism is kind of the uh, or that 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 development which is uh, signifying progress is at one and at the same time the march of capitalism signifies the march of capitalism that's that's how it has appeared and i'm going to describe theoretically uh, in a, as a theoretical frame uh, how it has uh, appeared so that is what i'm going to uh, show and that it's part of this trap uh, unless we get out of it uh that we might be discussing this here or there but uh, we will not be moving out of uh, this foundational trap of that we are stuck in a capitalocentric and an orientalist that is in the context of development it is not just capitalocentrism it is not just orientalism which functions but the epistemology is a combination a complex combination of the two and once you accept number one number two is a logical it will have to be a teleological uh, you know unfolding uh, there will be underlying purpose which will drive the uh, everything uh, and hence the history of uh, of the of uh, whatever you know whoever is following this particular frame so it's a matter of framing framing is crucial because in the in a country like that of india it has redefined actually uh, that what krishna chandra hattacharya talks that uh, you know our lives have been adapted to the times you know the teleology the time that development uh, uh, talks about but really for us 
the politics of reconstruction must begin from a different perspective where we have to we'll we'll have to at least start by reversing this uh, this this understanding uh, by uh, by adapting by thinking about how we can adapt time or the times to our life you know so uh, uh, and i think it this is very important because in a sense it captures this small thing in, in the sense of red, uh, why marx was uh, in in such a way in 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 a way actually a critique of uh, this uh, adaptation of life to the times and not uh, and de and in a way in defense of the working class was and the concrete reality of the working class was trying to respond to it by uh, talk by calling for a different way to organize our uh, forms of life including in the economic forms of our society and accordingly move from there so it's a it's a perspective perspectival uh, uh, thing we are talking about and really in the field of what i want to argue here in the field of when we talk about development Uh, what holds the logic of development or what constitutes the logic of development uh, uh, all of us know what what it is as 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 in some way or other we have come across it but what constitutes is it is the basic premise foundation of economic dualism so we talked about all other kinds of dualism in the field of economics i think when we came to colonialism development and so on and so forth as we unfolded what unfolded in the field of uh, the uh, the field of economics at least in the discourse of development was a kind of dualism and this dual that we have to begin with this dual that this is normal this is what is natural and it is the picture and to use a virginstinian uh quote which is something i love that it is such a picture that there is that not only are we held captive to it but to its language mechanisms and practices politics you know we are as if incarcerated imprisoned uh by this picture we can't get out of it or beyond it you know that's why i call it a trap you know uh now what is this picture to summarize actually this dualism uh, in a theoretically you can in a generalized way you can summarize it in terms of uh, this two uh, p is the center and this is the not p okay not p is what is not p i mean i mean it literally so the attributes of whatever is the not p will be what is the opposite of p so once you choose p not p appears actually uh, you choose p as the center not p appears as the devalued other it's not just the other we are talking about a devalued other okay of of p okay a lacking other of p because not p is defined in terms of what it lacks of of p so uh, in this regard then economic dualism has gone through uh, many kinds of dualism and this is part of the standard development discourse actually so modern tradition div division many of you might have uh, come across the louisian model or the or the other kinds of dualistic models you know capitalism pre capitalism industry agriculture formal informal not one thing this picturization involves that the right hand side is defined in a way which lacks the attribute of the left hand side and it's it's this picturization foundation which you begin with appears as if it is the lacking other of the uh, of the uh, of the p modern capitalism Uh, industry and formal is appears as the p therefore 
when we talk about development, almost we talk about these movements synonymously, that it is simultaneously a movement from pre-capitalism. Note, it is pre-capitalism, something that is archaic, that is history. So it has, it is passe, okay? So pre-capitalism to capitalism, tradition to modern, agriculture. First of all, we talked, Lewis model, remember, we talked about movement from agriculture to industrial economy. And then Harris Todaro presented the problem, right? Hart and Harris Todaro that not everybody would be accommodated. So you divided the industrial sector into formal and informal. So to complete the process of development, what must happen? Uh, that is movement from agriculture to industrial is industry, industrialization. There must be formalization of the informal sector, which is how ILO sees it. If you, because ILO is one who you have created international institutions, development institutions, dealing, and this is a language it produces relentlessly, okay, in terms of its gap, different kind of language, which actually is driving, which is based on the on this logic that uh, on this dual on this dual frame that one is the inferior other the lacking other of the of uh, 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 lacking other compared to the center and that it always involves a relentless uh, tr tr transition the transition when we talk about the term transition is the assimilation of not p in the image of uh, p so the transition, when you think about of economies is projected to be big bang and teleological. It has a purpose that is uh, an underlying purpose in terms of which the transition will happen. A very important to understand, you can't have this idea of development unless you have a dual in this sense. What is this dual creating? It is creating a hierarchy, a ladder. It's creating a ladder. So. It's a question, unless you create this ladder at an analytical level. So you cannot define development as progress in terms of movement from the lower ladder to the higher level ladder, from backwardness to underdevelopment to uh, less developed to uh, middle developed to develop. It's a question of climbing in the image whatever your position, it is defined in terms of its uh, relation with P, in terms of its distance with P, you know, so, and that's what driving it. So now we have, for example, in India, this thing that the major problem in not getting the Louisian turn is that there is large informal sector. So that is the problem. So how do we achieve the formalization of informal sector such that informal sector in industry process of industrialization would be completed. Now, this is a universal overwhelming uh, presence of capital throughout, capitalism throughout, the driving logic being uh, a, a movement towards capitalism and uh, towards a full-fledged capitalism. Uh, and uh, and uh, the, the whole discourse then boils down to a fact that uh, how do you think of politics, alternative politics or politics of reconstruction if you are, once you are in this frame, okay, incarcerated in this frame and in the language of this frame, yeah, you don't have kind of uh, any avenues to, to, to uh, think of going in a different direction. Now, a classic example of mainstream, how mainstream economics are dominant. The chief ones, the chief economist of World Bank, we know Koushik Basu, and one of the leading uh, uh, development economists in the world. You know, and so how it's a classic example of how uh, economists who have who otherwise uh, understand that there is some problem. So who have who. Who, uh, who understand that there is an issue with this taking, but or starting with this development paradigm, uh, this dual, dual economy paradigm, uh, more precisely, which is underlying development. So for development to happen, what must you have to begin with at the foundation? Dualism, economic dualism. There cannot be any development discourse 
in the way we know it without the conception of economic dual. It's simply non-existent. It can't exist. So the, the, the uh, Kaushik Basu, for example, fully well understand its importance, you know, and so he was trying to defend. I, I don't have to um, read it out for you uh, because uh, he, he was trying to defend economic dualism by saying that it is an empirical uh, issue, really. And there's nothing methodologically disturbing about it. You know? So it's okay to begin with uh, this economic dualism. It's not a major theoretical issue. Uh, it's basically you want, uh, you, you want to further heterogenize the space, bring other things. You can bring it within the dual. So you have rural versus urban sector, you can bring it within this dual, all kinds of heterogeneity. Capitalism, pre-capitalism, you bring in all kinds of heterogeneity within the dual. You informal, we know there has been huge discourse on heterogeneity of informal sector. You bring in, once you have fixed, once you prefix the dual, formal and informal, you bring all kinds of heterogeneity, impose all kinds of heterogeneity in this P-centric, or, or dual frame. And, but the point remains that no matter how many heterogeneities you impose, how many differentiations you produce within this dual frame, you are still stuck in this dual frame. That is what you are reiterating. You are reiterating at the end, the, the language of P not P, that is P centric. Actually, there is two. It seems there is two. Okay, it's a structure of two, but actually there is, it's only, the logic is only one, that of one. So there is monism because the logic is P-centric, which is driving this structure throughout, this economic dualistic structure throughout. So the point is what I have tried to show in various responses to my work is that there is, this is, there is everything that is unlike what the economic dual, those who defend and do economic dualism, take it as the basis of, uh, he was also the, by the way, the chief economist in India uh, from 2000, uh, I forgot the exact period, uh, till 2012 or 13, you know. Uh, so he's a very well-known development economist we are talking about actually one of the front frontline development economists the point i what i do take take uh, take into account is that i try to argue on this point you know one of one of the major things that there is everything that is methodologically disturbing about this assumption why because it confers an a priori pre given extra discursive epistemological power okay here Theoretical epistemology through this turns into political epistemology because you are, even before you begin the analysis and the policies and the practices and the institutions you build up, you are presuming, you are, you are embodying a epistemological privilege. Okay, and the epistemological privilege is to capital or modern or whatever. That's why these are, these are again traps of dualism we are talking about which then works over everything else, whether policies or practices or institutions you create, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a question of the, the, the theoretical epistemology slips into, through this assumption, political epistemology, and this political epistemology then creates a kind of uh, structure where the power of capital and the uh, and the power of you know uh, third worldism uh, as a discourse is, is is supreme okay and uh, if it is normalized then it becomes as koshik boshu is trying to say a benign assumption it is not a benign assumption it is a question of power that we are talking about you know so i we really in various kinds of work one of the paper i have sent you on the Louisian model, we, I contest this particular uh, framing and try to demonstrate why uh, there is a problem, methodological problem uh, in, in this particular 
beginning or the particular epistemology of development, which is the epistemology of development is the centricity of capital that you are taking in relation to the economy that is capitalocentrism. And it is the centricity of third worldism, which is a result of the Orient, uh, Orientalism. So capitalocentric Orientalism becomes then the epistemological uh, frame actually, which is working here. I need not do it. So how do I demonstrate? Uh, Professor Park, how many hey. minutes do I have? Uh, uh, we have uh, we are planning to close uh, 30, uh, 3, 3.40, but in a, in a 10 minutes, would you briefly? Uh, okay, okay. Yes, okay. in a 10 All minutes. Right. Can, okay, okay. okay. <laughs> so how do, the, if this is the problem, and really, as I told you, the problem is that of politics. Uh, how do we think of uh, an alternative in this frame? That's one way to think of the problem. Uh, that, and how do you extract it from within the discourse and dealing with the discourse of development? Now, if you begin with Marx, and this I'm going very telegraphically, actually. If you begin with Marx, and why we are using mode of class process of surplus labor, performance, appropriation, distribution, and receipt of surplus labor as our entry point is uh, that uh, Marx, uh, if, uh, as we understand Marx, for Marx, a crucial, uh, you know, di distinction that Marx, various kinds of economic forms of societies uh, are based on the modes of uh, performance and appropriation, which can be exploitative, non-exploitative, self-appropriative. So you can have different kinds of modes of exploitation. Now, let me go telegraphically. Uh, I'm not reading this because uh, it is there, all there, and the slides have been sent to you. Uh, now, the point which uh, we demonstrate here, going step by step, is if I take the modes of performance and appropriation, then we can generate through it uh, a, a kind of class matrix, not that this exhausts everything, but I'm not going to go into the details if we don't have the time, but this reflects the various kinds of uh, uh, you know, class economic forms of societies, class forms that may exist in uh, society together. So they will coexist together in a relation of, uh, you know, uh, along with in a relation of overdetermination and contradiction with other non-class processes, you know. So uh, you have independent, AA is independent class process, you know, you have exploitative class process. So you have these kinds of uh, various kinds of class processes. So, uh, you know, moving from independent, communistic, communitic, uh, exploitative class processes, which can be, of course, uh, you know, further delineated in terms of capitalist, feudal, and slave class process. Now, what have I done with this? What have we done, actually? Why did we do it? Uh, the reason is simple, that you need, uh, let me not, I, we don't have the time for it. Actually, if you go further, you go further, uh, you can, we produce another method. This was actually delivered by Stephen Cullenberg, and then uh, we further developed it on, in our own terms, that if you take the performance and appropriation of surplus labor, those four class uh, class forms, uh, six class forms, I'm sorry, those six class forms, uh, and you, you consider the two constitutive condition, non-class conditions, which are output distribution and worker dist remuneration, uh, wage or non-wage, output is commodity, non-commodity, then six multiplied by four, it will be 24 class sets. At least at the preliminary analytical level, what you get is an understanding of these economic forms of society even at the abstract preliminary level. Now, if you follow this, okay, just, I mean, we don't have the time, I don't have the time to explain it, but just following this, look at this, five, class set five is capitalist and class set 17 is capitalist because we know cap for a, capitalist has to be exploitative 
okay, which is AB and CB, and that is the performer are excluded from the process of the appropriation of the surplus, and that the uh, the labor power and uh, and output use value has to be in market form. So out of the twenty four class set, if you follow Marx's frame, the class process of surplus labor is the entry point, then the conception, what you get is this, that the conception of economy immediately breaks into a disaggregated class sets or class processes of all kinds, okay, of all kinds. Even what you called non-capitalism appears as a disaggregated, actually can be broken down as a disaggregated continuum of uh, various kinds of non-capitalist class processes, some of which, please try to follow me, some of which are exploitative, okay, some of which are non-exploitative, and some of which are self-appropriate, independent, that is, or what Marx sometimes would call a following it, ancient or something like that, whatever different names have been given at different times. Crucial point is, so only only five and 17 here are, are capitalist class sets, okay, are capitalist forms. So what we have done, the result is two theses that we have differentiated. Immediately what happens is capitalism becomes different from the economy. Remember the first problem, where capitalism, there's an isomorphism. You start with an isomorphism. It's, this is part of the classical political economy, the way it has evolved, you know, remember, and coming to the presenter, that economy is capitalist, capitalist is economy, as if you move in both together. What you have done to, through Marx's frame, reading Marx's frame in a certain way is broken down uh, this, uh, this uh, relation, isomorphic relation between capitalism and economy. You can't reduce now one to the, other. When you reduce one to the other, okay, when you create a centrism, right, this now is a dualism, first step of the dualism, capitalism, non-capitalism. How do you create it? By taking 5 and 17 as the center. That's what I call the epistemological, first step of the epistemological privilege. You create 5 and 17 of, as the center and the rest you club at as non-capitalist. Now, so you create an other of capitalism. The problem here is this centricity, this privileging involves an epistemological exclusion of class, a foreclosure, okay? Because once you start from it, this dualism, what is foreclosed here, okay, uh, from this dualism, which is present actually, but what is foreclosed from this, represent it is the element of class, class process of surplus labor. Because once you have, once you bring back class process of surplus labor, you can't have this homogeneous non-capitalism. It breaks down. Okay. So you have to talk in terms then of feudal class set, communist class set, community class set, or class formations, and so on and so forth. The moment you, so the dual, first step of the dual, which is capitalocentric, involves a process where you are deducting the occulting, the presence of class as surplus labor from the discursive terrain itself. And this is something I challenge people in different kinds of semi, uh, you know, places I've worked, talked to or worked upon. You give me one instance, one instance in the in IMF, World Bank, or any literature where there is mention of surplus labor in the sense Marx talks about. That is what we call foreclosure. Foreclosure is just not empirical outside that you can bring it. This is an outside which whose outsidedness is such that there is no way you can introduce it, you can bring it, you can make it, make its presence a part of the frame because you can't, if you do that, you can't then 
even begin with the P not P frame, it will immediately break down. Okay. So uh, that is what it is. The second step, just to finish the matter, and we don't have much time, I know. The second step, which is necessary for development, is pre non, it's just not a non capitalism we are talking about in relation to capitalism. In the context of the southern countries, it took us, it took a particular form, this not P. It took the form of not P in the sense that non capitalism, which is the other of capitalism, was further translated into, through devaluation, into a lacking other of capitalism. And that work, that work was is the result what we call for us orientalism is just not historical orientalism is a theoretical category as well we don't just talk about white orientalists we talk about brown orientalists as well okay so black orientalists just like in the way amy caesar and many and many other people have talked about you uh, so that what does it do it translates this frame into this hierarchy it's just not the other, other hierarchical in a in a, in a horizontal plane capitalism non capital. It is capit. You turn this horizontality into a verticality now, into a ladder like system, okay, where the other is a devalued, lacking other. Sometimes the victim other, poor, marginalized, this that. Sometimes it is the evil other, hist hysterical, you know. Uh, anarchic and all that. Sometimes it's the it it is the uh, redundant other like communism, Gandhianism, post-capitalism, post-developmentalism. So there are various ways, and I can go on and on. We describe each one of them through which this whole categorization of P not P has appeared in the form of economic dualism in the discourse of development. So. Here then there is a foreclosure that I will just, this is the final point, uh, a foreclosure. This, what you are doing with this not P then, turning pre -cap, turning non-capitalism into, into an archaic historical passe existence, which was there at some times, but with history will now pass away. You, what you are doing with it is through that projection, this projection is what is defined as third world. So third world is the internal other of P not P. Okay, third world stands for pre-capitalism. It personifies pre-capitalism. Okay, so all these victim other, marginalized, poor, et cetera, et cetera, whichever way you look at it, redundant other, and all these as if are evil other, you know, we talk in terms of historical, irrational, archaic, whatever form we may talk about. So in that sense, this third world then is a fiction, okay? It is, it is the reality, the reality of what is outside of capital is translated, transmuted into a reality as seen from the lens of capital, okay? As seen from the lens of capital. So what happens by foregrounding this third world is that you end up foreclosing, okay? Putting out, just as we, we talked about foreclosure of class, foreclosing the world of the third. What, this is what we define as, that this X, which is absent in P not P, is the structure of the two. Actually, the structure of the two is constituted by a third, which is fore, foreclosed, the world of the third with its own language, with its language, logics, ethos, experience of the other. So it's like being in a class where, you know, the teacher calls for a roll call and the student, the st uh, somebody, uh, you know, uh, puts out a name and somebody says, I am present, uh, present, just announces present. But actually the person, this is a proxy. So the person who is the actual person is not present. So the proxy here is like, just to use this metaphor, 
is this third word is the proxy of 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 what is excluded what is there what is there in reality but not not discursively present in the language in the formulation and the logics of it. Uh, and then the discourse is teleological because the work on uh, the, the march of history through development or progress is actually work on world of the third through primitive accumulation, violence, et cetera, et cetera, which is seen by unjust. But from the perspective of third world, what you are trying to do here is trying to lift the uplift the third world. So what is seen as upliftment from the logic of capital is seen as unjust from the, from the perspective of world of the third, producing a scenario of resistance and clashes and which is part of the history. I will stop here because there is a limit to what we can go on. Actually, just to tell you uh, in, in 30 seconds what I wanted, I, I, we had done this. Uh, we had, uh, I had dissected the Lewis model and actually showed how this capitalocentric orientalist model is, is at the base of the structure and Lewis and the logic of the Lewis model, where the left hand side is defined, is actually defined in terms of what it lacks of the, uh, of, of the right hand side and the logic of transition, which is at the basis of the Lewis model and the classic development paradigm is based on uh, you know, various kinds of principles that are functioning over um, this particular frame. Okay, if there is any questions, I will perhaps discuss. We don't have the time. Thank you very it. much. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yes, uh, Dr. Uh, the Chakravati, uh, uh, thank you very much for your the insightful and masterful presentation. May I uh, get into directly the open debate? Uh, yes. Yes, okay. Who's on the first? Uh, the, if you have any question, please don't hesitate to ask to Professor. Should I, should I keep this, Professor Park, should I keep this uh, slide here or should I close it? Uh, up to 4.30. 4 uh, please, uh, uh, up to 4.30, we have uh, some minutes. For oh. the ask and question. All right, all right. Yeah. Perhaps uh, while you're uh, the thinking of the question, let me pose a question to Professor Anzan first. Three. Uh, recently, I had read through your paper on the rethinking uh, Marxism. Also, uh, you you had mentioned about uh, the reverse migration in a human mm -hmm. history and about uh, the crafts crafts of the uh, development model. Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, in line with this uh, paper, uh, would you uh, like to mention about the prospect uh, on the uh, post-COVID? Uh, the Indian economy from now on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You see, uh, I mean, that would be very, a very interesting talk I've given in many places <laughs> uh, regarding the direction of the Indian economy. And that paper is there, you know, it's here. Mm -hmm. And those who are interested can look at it, you know. Uh, thank you for your question, you know. Uh, as you, if you have gone over that paper, you must understand that the perspective is whatever I am, we are developing here actually, is the perspective from where it is uh, written. In terms, of, uh, in terms of the hegemonic discourse, the problem is that as the Indian economy is in dire trouble now, uh, and as the social structures are, uh, you know, are under stress, existing social structures are under stress as a result of it, uh, and nowhere is it greatly uh, indicated by this whole phenomena of uh, migration, you know, rural to urban migration is part of the Louisian frame. If you, if you uh, remember the Louisian frame, then the transition logic says that, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. 
the transition logic, just to put it in the context, says that uh, talks about uh, progress in terms of transition of pre-capitalism into a modern capitalist uh, economy. So it's a transformation of the third world in the image of, of modern capitalist industrial economy. So uh, the last 60 years in India has, as I told you, this has been the dominant understanding, you know. So how, at, you know, and one of the way the Lewisian model describes it is in terms of one of the empirical demonstration of this, whether it is succeeding or not, is in terms of whether rural uh, workforce is moving to the cities. So whether voluntarily or through primitive accumulation, you know, and though the lines between the two, voluntarily and primitive accumulation is blurred. You know. So you might, and we, this is part of India's history, which we have also dealt with uh, at times. Now, what this phenomena, when the COVID, uh, this pandemic hit, and uh, what we witnessed, what you witnessed was kind of collapse of this model in the sense that those who had gone to the cities to look for absorption in the modern capitalist economy were most of them, overwhelming number of them, were not finding entry to the circuits of global capital, which is what they, they were targeting, uh, the absolutely modern uh, form of the economy. They were really in the world of the third. The world of the third is not something that is rural. Okay, it is something that is outside. What we theorize is something which is outside the circuits of global capital. So we are following this class focus frame. So in terms of that, you have a world of the third space in Delhi and world of the third space in the rural area. So anyway, in agriculture, agricultural sector or the rural sector was already in dire stress and you must have heard of the, uh, you know, a farmer's agitation which are taking place, which is a result of the agrarian distress, uh, which has been ongoing for the last five, six years. Uh, because of this, uh, you know, uh, scenario whereby the rural sector has, is under stress, you know, uh, through dislocation, displacement, that is primitive accumulation and depression of income, you know. Uh, so people, you know, were moving to the cities and this was considered as good in terms of the development logic as part of the upliftment. So when the circuits of global capital, what the pandemic did was the circuits of global capital disappeared because that connection uh, between the various markets immediately disintegrated and which meant that people who were inside the circuits of global capital who had come from the rural areas or those who are at the margins, you know, that is in the world of the third uh, space, you know, uh, overwhelmingly large number, they hardly had anything, any, any more work to do. And that was the reason that also tells you that this whole uh, discourse of aspiration that they are going never to come back to the villages actually uh, needs to be rethought. We need to rethink it, at least in so far as the first and second generation is concerned, because Given this fact, many of them had land in their villages or house, some member of the family with their house in the villages and they were, they started coming back and inducing what we may call the biggest reverse migration in contemporary uh, history actually. And we are talking about uh, tens and millions, tens of millions of people, if not crores of people, you know, there is no accounting of it just images and we know the uh, little bit of the statistics of it. So, uh, you know, it's that's why I say the collapse of capital, global capitalism uh, is associated with the collapse of dev the development discourse in the way we, I have presented it and in the way which was the dominant discourse in, in India, you know. And so the government is again here. There are two ways to go about it. The government is trying to again, fix this situation such that the circuits of global capital can again uh, begin its, uh, its, its journey. So one of the way thing they do, they got rid of the labor laws, they, have got, they got rid of the environmental laws. So making it absolutely, you know, flattening out 
uh, the, the question of labor, the question of uh, ecology, uh, uh, and giving in the entire space to the private capital, private global capital. Uh, you come and you make anything in India. You know we will, the government will ensure it assures the rest. So, rest. So it is what it is trying to do is reassert uh, this uh, this particular frame in a certain way. There is more complexity to it, but that is one thing. Now, what I wanted to, what that paper or this is our point, and I, I couldn't go to it. That if you take uh, so. Th the government is again trying to produce this third world discourse of development. But if you look at it from the perspective of world of the third, from the perspective of these so-called peasants and informal workers, in a way, actually, these are just the peasant informal workers. I club it together. Uh, capitalism has never been able to resolve this problem in the last hundred years. In fact, that is the next thing that I'm trying to do, that if you take the 100 year history, um, global history, that this problem of dealing with peasant and the problem of dealing with the informal, you know, which is the same body, the same human population moving from one to the other is an outstanding problem of capitalism in, in, a, in, a, in a certain, maybe in certain parts of the world, I am sure it it could be different in Korea. I mean, I, I don't know much about it, of course. Thank you very they much. talk about it. Okay. So okay. Uh, how, how do you think of a, a, a reconstruction project from the perspective of the world of the third? That, that's the people. So we are trying to produce, go back to the talk in terms of the, this one way to look at it is the, the class sets, you know, which are falling, the non-exploitative class sets, which are falling in the, uh, in, in in this frame and trying to create a, a different kinds of politics. Many people are doing it, by the way, trying to do it at the ground level. Thank you very much. Yes. Okay. Uh, next, uh, I will uh, I will turn my microphones to uh, Mr. Chin Young Jung and uh, Mr. Mr. Jung. Uh, pre. Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, actually, I. Yeah, I, I uh, just uh, wrote about <laughs> to ask uh, Mr. Chakrabari my personal question about uh, great presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm a first student in the Department of Political Economy. Actually, I would like to learn from your presentation today. Um, you uh, presented about uh, many factors uh, about the era and historical uh, background of reconstruction in Indian economy. Well, not only economy, but all aspects of uh, uh, social politics, many things uh, in the course of, uh, of uh, Buruja uh, economic capitalist development. Have you ever thought about uh, a kind of a factor of, uh, I mean, a religious factor uh, related to reconstruction issue? Mm -hmm. Because uh, I mean, uh, well, I do not say uh, you did omit about this issue religion, uh, but I think, but I think it's a very important issue in uh, Indian history and society because uh, up and down, top and bottom, all different religious, religious factions, uh, dominant religious faction, uh, not really dominant affection, sometimes a uh, religious world like uh, we know that. So uh, that's up to you. Uh, you want to mention about that, why you did not uh, talk about today, or have you ever thought about this uh, religious issue? Thank you. Thank, thank you, Professor Jong. I'm, uh, I'm glad you asked this question. I mean, uh, you can see me, right? And because this has also been 
uh, one of the questions we have been pursuing in parallel and uh, part of our, uh, you know, what the kind of work we have been doing. Uh, in fact, uh, myself, uh, Onup, who is my co-author and Serap Kayatekin, uh, who was previously the editor of Rethinking Marxism, we edited a volume in Rethinking Marxism, specialized, specially dedicated to Marxism and spirituality, uh, where we had also written uh, a paper where the problem is Marxism and spirituality and how do you theorize the and because the question that you are raising is very crucial of religion for us there is no politics you can do in india for example you can think of reconstruction without addressing the question of religion or the spiritual in fact what we do is we what we are trying to do is uh, you know conceptualize spirituality as different from religion. And then, because uh, uh, we, we think of this as another uh, conflation between spiritual and uh, religion. So there can be, of course, there is there could be relation between the two, but we are trying to think over the concept of spirituality and in its relation to Marxism. And just for your, uh, you know, for your interest, this is a very recent edited book. I just picked it. It was close, close to, uh, you know, uh, it was just present here. So if you are really interested in how we are pursuing it, this is a collection of uh, writings of some of the major thinkers, Marxist thinkers in the world who are thinking uh, through this question. So, uh, uh, you know, this certainly is again for me i stumbled upon a, uh, i'm i stumbled upon this issue because again from my personal interest in or my object of what i do in terms of uh, politics uh, that how can we think of politics in the context of a country like india without addressing the issue of spiritual whether it could be religious or it could be in secular domain as well how do you how do you think through how do you have a dialogue with it and how do you then have or even a critical dialogue at times but also sometimes a friendly dialogue but more importantly how do you or can you theorize this and a and d between marxism and the and the spiritual can you build a connection because we think the practice of marxism in the last 100 years has tumbled on this question greatly and has greatly, you know, it need not have been in this way, but it went in a certain way. So we, we are certainly aware of your question and we think of your in, uh, question in a very, as a very important question as constituent of how we should think of politics in the future. So okay, if you are- nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Okay. If you if you allow me uh, one more very very yes. brief question, uh, can you tell us uh, in India some part of uh, religiously dominant uh, bourgeois class mm -hmm. are they occupying more higher income in higher income formal jobs instead of uh, informal uh, jobs they are occupying? You see, uh, religion can be big business. <laughs> we know that. <laughs> so <laughs> it can be. I mean, uh, you, you know, if you turn it into a business, it's one thing. But I think that's a simplification with respect to India. I think what you are talking about more is in terms of the caste, okay? uh, especially the higher caste, uh, you know, uh, whether they are occupying uh, the, the dominant position of uh, both economic and social power. And hence, they exercise, since the caste system to a certain degree is arising from a religious order, okay, as a religious order. So they are, uh, in a way, actually, uh, could be seen at times as, as uh, commanding, uh, you know, uh, that the, those positions, you know, in certain way, but 
you know religious practices in in india actually is very uh, you know differentiated you know you can't reduce it to just those people you know so Thank you, uh, you know, mm-hmm. that is what i would say you, please don't have this misconception that it is only that yeah, you know so you have sects and other religious practices which are you had you had social movements against oppression which were religious in nature that's a history of india some of the major social movements the reform movements in india were religious movements thank so, you and thank you people were killed as a result of it i mean saints were killed as, as a result of it. thank you very much for yeah. the good question and the insight for answer then i will turn the microphone to professor jong song jin uh, for the second question okay Oh, yes. Yes. oh yeah. yeah, actually, I wrote uh, my question in the chat box. So, Anjan, can you yes, read yes, that? Yes. My question? Uh, let me see. Let me see. Let me go to the chat box. Yes. Oh, 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 oh I missed out that. Okay, okay. Let me see. Just give me one minute. Okay. Oh, do you see? Or, yeah, then, then may I? Yes, yes. Yeah, okay, yes, it's good. Uh, thank you. Uh, just a minute, much. just a minute, just one minute. Uh... Yes, yes. I mean, I will answer, for dearth of time, I'll answer your last question. To, the, to your first question, the answer is yes. Okay. To the next one, uh okay. just i'll take two minutes oh okay. three minutes actually to answer <laughs> okay. it okay all right and uh, just give me three minutes uh, now if you look at this uh from place to uh, space to place you see gibson graham i have a there there is a limitation to what they present in terms of capital centrism that's why i'm saying even in terms of politics it is not enough so it is not enough to have non capitalism okay non capitalism so you have circuits of global capital 5 and 17 so there can be various class sets which can be attached to 5 and 17 and and creating the circuits of global capital and therefore and the rest of the class sets so for example uh, you know uh, you take uh, i'm sorry uh, you take uh, for example uh, two non commodity you know that kind of class enterprise cannot sell it to uh, global capital or global capitalist enterprise or other kinds of capitalist enterprise to circuit it so what you are what we are doing here is just to give you a quick response here uh, uh, coming back to because this is something i cannot could not go into that we go into those class sets in terms of our formulation which are non capitalist and which are non exploited among the heterogeneous non capitalist space so now just to have the heterogeneous non capitalist space is not enough okay so we are not in favor of a post capitalist economics economy or post capitalist politics that builds itself from everything that is non capitalist because within non capitalism if you look at the class sets there are exploitative class sets and there are there is non exploitative uh, there is self appropriative class set and there is non exploitative class set. we have problem with exploitation that's our marxist take from a from a class focused problem in terms of exploitation so what we do is circuits of global capital we create the space of world of the third but then you have to move one step further so the struggle is not just with with capital the struggle is also within world of the thought to transform it to reconstruct it that is to transform it through struggle over those class class processes against the non capitalist class processes to produce a reconstruction of world of the thought that's a politics through praxis because you can't 
unless you do it they can't happen okay so that itself then is we conceptualize then between space and place space for us is just that space which is outside of the p not p circuits of global capital but we don't end up valorizing the world of the third it's not good evil or indifference relation of indifference for us it has all of that okay so it is also a matter of situating the place of politics in it okay the space is not enough conceptual a concept of space place has to be defined and that place uh, which is cocooned is what has to be the the object of politics from a marxist perspective okay so i don't know whether i have been able to answer it in the time that i have uh, professor jiang but uh, you know if you go over the uh, i uh, the, the I, i can see that you have gone over it you know so we it basically is a move that we are making conceptual move from space as lacking to space as difference to space as a site of uh, and spur of becoming so if the first is uh, you know uh, third worldism the second is shifting it to world of the third conceptually to distinguish it from third world you know so you have at least opened up the space a different space for consideration and the next part is that when you are talking about reconstruction it cannot be just you know bringing the third world of the third as it is because as it is it is a differentiated space consisting of all kinds of a uh, non capitalist or other kinds of uh, class processes and many of which are exploitative okay and therefore you have to redefine uh, you know you have to undertake a reconstructive politics with respect to world of the third within world of the third itself for reconstruction so that is where we are uh, going uh, in terms of our uh, structure of thought you know uh, you know we amy caesar has an interesting uh, okay okay i don't go okay. any further on this but i i don't know whether i have been i have answered your question satisfactorily to some extent actually this is this could have been another talk actually uh, going to world of the third you know. but okay, you thanks. get the idea you get the idea thank you so much yeah. uh now we have time for one more question uh if you have a burning question please don't hesitate uh one more question please Okay. Is there any question? Okay. I think if there are no an other question, I now uh, declare uh, today's uh, talk closed. Uh, it was very a uh, great uh, pleasure to spend time with you. On behalf of all of you, ladies and gentlemen. I want to appreciate especially uh, Dr. Anjan Mukherjee, uh, Anjan Chakrabarti uh, for a marvelous talk. And uh, I wish uh, you recover and uh, we will uh, meet again soon, uh, soon or later. Right. Thank you very much. Goodbye Thank everybody. Much. Thank you. Thank you Chakrabarti. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you.